gravity and don't even have the inverse square law to large distances, you can explain some of these uh, anomalies without putting in dark matter. But uh, there's no uh, consistent way. To give you an example, um, if you have a cluster of galaxies, then there are three ways you could interpret its mass. Uh, one is by um, uh, looking at the relative motions of the galaxies moving around and working out how much mass there must be in the cluster uh, if it doesn't fly apart. Okay. You, could, you, you could measure the relative motion about a thousand kilometers per second and that tells you what the mass has to be. And that indicates dark matter. You can also uh, uh, measure the temperature of the gas in that cluster of galaxies. Very hot gas that's supported in a potential well and by the next rays you can get its temperature. And that also gives you a mass because the pressure depends on the temperature that expands the gravity. And the third way is by gravitational lensing. You could look at galaxies behind a cluster and you find the light uh, is bent and you see background objects distorted and you can work out the mass that way. And I don't mean 10 <coughs> or something kilometers, I mean 10 kilometers. So if we put one down on Hastings, Eastbourne will be okay. Bexhill a bit, <coughs> marginal. Really, really small, huge mass in a pretty tiny ball as astronomical standards go. And so the density is very high. They're very compact objects. And for the physicists, the average density is like the density of the nucleus of the atom. I find that hard to visualize, so I've got an alternative way of looking at it. Take a sewing thimble, preferably a nice, elegant, silver sewing thimble. Take the population of the world, seven billion people and jam those seven billion people into the thimble one by one. When you have them all in the thimble, the thimble weighs as much as it would if it were made of pulsar material. Or like if it was full of nuclei of atoms. <coughs> now it's slightly more comprehensible but it's still clearly a very big number. If the black hole is the end of a star, where does a star come from? How does, how does a star start? Okay, how do you start? So you basically have a big clump of, of gas, and as Simon was saying earlier, a, a beautiful object in the night sky in the moment, if the Orion Nebula, take a look through even a, a binoculars or a small telescope, and you can see it's like a, a, a fuzzy cloud, and that cloud is a big collection of gas, and gravity pulls all our gas together, literally screens and stars into existence. So that's how you make stars. And then, after a few 10 billion years, the star comes to the end of its life, and then the centre of the star collapses, the outer layers explode off into space, and that explosion will trigger the next generation of, of stars. Um, so it's a, a recycling process. One star generation forms, it dies, and in the explosion, the next generation is triggered to form. And, and we think the sun is the um, third generation of stars to, be, to exist. It must be the more than the first, because we're, left, we're made up of the leftover remains of the star. So there was at least one star here nearby. And we think we're the third generation. I think I've covered pretty much everything. <laughs> 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 uh, you mentioned radio emissions from Jupiter. What is yeah. the source of that? Um, it's to do with the, the rotation of the, uh, the, the gases and the bands, and, and you get uh, different frequencies <coughs> coming out of, of Jupiter at, at different times <coughs> um, 10, 20, 30 megahertz. Um, and as it rotates, uh, you, you get um, what's it called? free free electron radiation. So uh, protons and electrons knock off, um, and, uh, protons and electrons spiral around magnetic uh, uh, 
the, the, the magnetosphere of Jupiter and created it in a dramatic ways. Um, they're, they're very often called whistlers because they do whistle a lot and, and change a lot. So it's, uh, but it's, it's quite an interesting subject on its own. Um, some people do just study that. Which, uh, it, it is something to do in that garden. Uh, I mean, the area where you build is um, 10 feet square, made of wire, costing very little. So in radio detection Jupiter's, it's more of analysis to understand what we've got uh, and plotting it. We'll buy some large glass and charts. So, uh, there are different times. This has to be. Uh, a lot of radio astronomy is, is about deep things, not something that comes around. Jupiter's one of those odd ones. The idea in doing the last servicing mission that it would last for at least another five years. So we've done, we're nearly two years into. So nominally another three years, but I think it will actually be decided by um, the funding of the project, which is always difficult, especially in the current US scientific climate, and also the kind of um, ways in which Hubble will break, because Hubble will break, parts of the spacecraft will break, and the instruments will break. Nothing is broken yet. In fact, Hubble has been amazingly reliable since the servicing mission. But I, my guess is that it will go on for um, seven or eight years after the servicing mission. So. Nothing is missing, and we know that. And that's something very important. It's a monument to human intellect, the periodic table produced by the stars. Hydrogen and helium come from the Big Bang, all the way down to iron, or to oxygen and carbon from stars which are not very massive. But most of the other chemical elements, the heavy ones, the ones I mentioned, the gold and the silver and the uranium, they are produced during the explosions of the stars. There. So any gold, any silver around your bodies is the result of these explosions there. And they are produced, they are assembled together in a matter of seconds, in a matter of minutes, because that explosion is cooling down very quickly. And this is why they are so rare, so valuable. The expanding universe implied that uh, everything was moving away from everything else. The universe was constantly in a state of expansion. But that meant that if you go back into the past, then everything was much closer together. Now, relativity, as we'll um, come to in a, in a little while, had a key sort of defining quality about it. And it was that, that uh, objects like galaxies tell you about space. So for example, think of the volume of this room. Does this vo the volume of this room, Einstein would argue, has no meaning if you take the room away. The walls of this room tell you about the volume of space. Without the walls, you, you, you can't talk about this volume of space. You need boundaries to do this. In the same way, you need um, atoms and molecules and things to interact if you are going to have time. Um, but they're it must recur, and the recurrence time scale is of the order of 10,000 years, which is why we only see them once. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let me introduce the dwarf novae first. These are rather smaller outbursts, uh, only about 100 times the quiescent brightness. But they're much more interesting from the point of view of the observer because they recur every few months. Um, some cases, sometimes it's every few years. Um, so there's time scales of months to years between outbursts. And so if you watch one of these objects for long enough, you're bound to catch it in, in outburst at some point. And here is the best observed of these objects, SS Cygni. It's actually been observed since the 1890s. And we have a light curve which goes all the way from the 1890s up to the present time but it was impossible to get all of the outbursts on a single slide, so I've just selected 70 years from 1930 to 2000. They've got NASA basically have got a, a, a big group 
which they basically spend their time getting the best, um, the best guesses for the paths that the planets are taking. And so they can get, they get you know, down to, to metres or tens of metres in terms of accuracy. Really, really high accurate, high accuracy computer simulations of where these planets are and where the moons are at any one time. And they're continually refining those calculations. And they use those calculations as their, um, to, to predict the path of Cassini itself on its, on its way out. But even, even on its way out, they're continually refining that. So it's not like you launch the spacecraft and that's it cast in stone. They can do little course corrections on the way to take into account new measurements, new estimates of where these planets are going to be at the time of the flyby. So it's quite a big effort. <coughs> you said you could download some of these pictures of you. Where from? These pictures are all available online. I haven't shown you anything that's proprietary. Yeah, the, um, you get them all at the Saturn NASA website. So saturn.jpl.nasa.gov. Or there's a website that's run by NASA called the Planetary Photo Journal. Uh, if you just Google Planetary Photo Journal, you'll find it. And there you can download pictures from any of the planets in the solar system and comets as well, taken by a whole variety of, of missions from Cassini through to the Hubble Space Telescope and so on. Know enough about, we do know that there are the tides of the fluid on the Earth, the oceans. We know, therefore, that that loads the crust of the Earth differently as the day changes. What we don't know is how the crust of the Earth responds to that varying load. And that could produce an effect that would be at the same sort of level. So we can't do better than this because we don't know enough about how the Earth behaves. And similarly, there could be an effect if the Earth's motion relative to some special frame were involved in the theory of gravity in the Earth's rotation rate. It would vary <coughs> slightly during the day. Uh, the big complication here is the motion of the atmosphere, and it's like the, the skater with their arms out. You know, if the winds are blowing one way, the, wind, the Earth plus its atmosphere is one total angular momentum, and if they're blowing the other way, it's different, and then that would affect the rotation rate. So that's the big uncertainty. So these eight tests eliminate almost everything that's been proposed as an alternative. But they're all very weak field tests. You can, in a meaningful way, say that the <coughs> field strength of the sun is about two parts in a million. On the grounds that it has about one five hundred thousandth times the radius it would have if, it were, if the same mass or a black hole. That's not true of the last test, which won the Nobel Prize in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1994. This was, we have better data than the Nobel Prize winning data from the double pulsar. The original result was done using the binary pulsar, which is a binary, one of whose elements was found to be a pulsar. Get a paradox or have a paradox about a particular aspect of nature then chances are it's because we haven't understood things of nature well enough. So in the book, I go through, I should say, nine paradoxes. There were going to be ten, but the publishers decided ten was a boring number <laughs> and, and that we should go, go for nine. But I'd already had ten, actually, that I wanted to talk about. And it turns out that actually one of them isn't a paradox of science. Uh, it's the, uh, the Monty Hall or Game Show paradox. Now, if I had more time, I would go into that a bit more. Um, but just to say, I mean, it's in the book, obviously you're all going to go off for mine if you haven't got already. Um, the, uh, the, the, the game show paradox is, is the one that is the, is the um, uh, brain teaser about. Uh, in, uh, in a game show, you know, there are three doors, and behind one of them is a prize, and you, the contestant, has to choose a door. So let's say you choose door A. And then I, as the game show host, open door B to reveal it's empty, and then ask you whether you want to stick with A or switch to door C. So you've got door A and door C closed. Now, the paradox is that when you first chose door A, uh, you have a, a one in sort of, you know, I mean, open door B to reveal there's no prize, you would think that there's now a 50 50 chance between A and C. In fact, the paradox is that mathematically, quite correctly, you should always switch the door C. Because no more to do then, I'll uh, introduce you. Oh, thank, thank you very much.
I'll just add that the proceeds from the table don't go to my pocket, they go to the campaign for Dark Skies, obviously. Uh, right, uh, hi there, good evening, I'm Bob Meisen, some of you have met me before. Um, I bang on about uh, lighting and the night sky, etc. I, I take a planetarium into schools. I was in Worthing a couple of days ago at Field Place First School, all the little five-year-olds sitting there in my inflatable plastic tent. I can get 35 kids in there, and one of the things I find really gratifying is that even five-year-olds now know about light pollution. I think one of the greatest things the campaign has done in the last 24 years of its existence is to sort of sensitize the public to the fact that there is a bit of a problem about light. Um, you say to small children, very small children, uh, you can't really see many stars from Worthing, can you? And one little clever dick pipes up, oh yes, it's because it's cloudy all the time. Yeah, you're right, son, it's been cloudy for the last seven weeks, hasn't it? Who's seen the stars much in the last two months? Not me. Uh, and the, another little person will pipe up, uh, oh yeah, night pollution. They know about it. A new cashier started in Santander the other day in Wimborne, where I live. Nice young lady, 20-something. And uh, I passed over the campaign passbook, you know. Oh, she said, campaign for dark skies. That's light pollution, isn't it? I said, oh, are you an astronomer? No. So my talk tonight is 12,756, which, of course, judging by the picture, you probably worked it out. Anybody worked it out? Yes? Yeah? It is the diameter of the Earth in kilometres, absolutely right, yes. The Earth is amazing, actually, really is amazing. Uh, to imagine that the processes that came to this have finished, you're wrong. All the processes that gave rise to the Earth are still going on today. It's just that some of those processes have subsided greatly because of the process of building a solar system, a stellar system. The one we belong to is called the solar system. And we now know of about 3,000 confirmed exoplanets, planets which we will, in the not too distant future, be able to study in a way that I think many of us in the audience would imagine absolutely impossible just a few years ago. So the things have moved on. Now, we have this beautiful world up here, and it is 12,756 kilometers in diameter. It orbits a G2-class star. Now, that in itself is really, really significant. Well, a chance it's happened again to confirm that it's a planet, basically. So we have candidates, let me see a transit. It's a candidate planet. And then when the planet's gone round again, it gets confirmed as a real planet. So that's what planet candidate means. And this data is beginning of this year. And we have 2,740 candidate planets. Around over 2,000 stars in this 100,000 star field of view. So, plotted another way, what do these planets look like? Well, that's how many Earth sized planets we've got. This class of planets are called super Earths, because basically the planetary people have classified exosolar planets into five broad categories. And we've got Earth sized planets, super Earths, which are basically up to twice the size of the Earth. Then we start looking at Neptune, we have Neptune sized planets, then Jupiter sized planets, and then super Jupiters. So those are the five broad classes. And some people split the Neptunes into a lower and upper band as well. And this shows the distribution, we're getting quite a few Earth planets now. Lots of super Earths, but the most common planets are Neptune sized planets. And if they're very heavy planets, they're getting much lower numbers. So, those are the results at the beginning of this year from the Kepler satellites. We had something which was pumping out the energy of a galaxy uh, from something which is, say, the size of the solar system. Well, what on Earth could actually produce that? Um, so, what's the source of their energy? And if you take our galaxy, I mean, if you go back and look at galaxies which are 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion light years away, that's where you see all the quasars sort of thing. So what's our galaxy? Well, the first one discovered, I believe, is that one, the third Cambridge catalogue, 273. And that's 2.5 billion light years away. 
And the furthest one, well, the trouble is I should Google this every time I give this talk because every time something takes place. But as the universe is supposedly 13.8 billion light years, 13.8 billion years old, you're not going to suddenly discover galaxies much further than 13 billion. Galaxies may have formed in the first 700 million years of the Big Bang. So you're not going to say, oh, I can see one at 14 billion light years away, because uh, light hasn't had time to travel to us yet. So they're far away, they're very energetic, and here's a picture of one. And lo and behold, you have a... What's that called? Yeah. Jet. So you've seen jets. Where have you seen them before in this talk? Black holes. Black holes? Yes. And um, so the mechanism that produces that may be the same one as in, in the case of a pulsar, uh, in, in, in the case of black holes with an accretion disk firing out along the axis. And these are measured, these temperatures are measured above absolute zero. Absolute zero is minus 273 degrees C. That's the coldest you can get to. We measure temperatures relative to that in something called the Kelvin scale. So if I talk about Kelvin, that's what I'm talking about, just the temperature. So hundreds of degrees Kelvin is pretty much room temperature. Tens of degrees Kelvin is actually about minus 250 degrees C, so pretty, pretty chilly by uh, uh, human standards. And so we can assign a temperature to various parts of this spectrum. Now, astronomy, in the, the astronomy using lots of these parts of the wavelengths really developed over the, course of the, uh, over the course of the 20th century. Radio astronomy first, and then later on into things like infrared astronomy. And so we can, we can look at the... There's not many graphs in this, but here's a, here's a graph of the brightness of the sky against, against wavelengths. So this is... If you smoothed the sky out and blurred it all out, how much light would you get at different, different wavelengths, different colours? So if you look at wavelengths that are down the bottom at one micron is the wavelength. That's visible light, optical light... If you like um, a little bit of infrared and a little bit of ultraviolet, and that yellow curve tells us how bright the sky is, how bright the, on average the sky is at those wavelengths. It's got a bump, so it peaks in sort of the optical, and that's stars. That's the glow from stars in our galaxy and other galaxies. We can add in a very, very long wavelength uh, in the microwave regime of the spectrum. Uh, we can add in the cosmic microwave background. I, I talked about that earlier with the history of the universe, and oh, I don't have time in this talk to talk about it in detail, but that's the glow of the, the early universe itself we're seeing. But what we then discover is that in the middle, there's another bump, and this is called the far infrared bump. So this is, this is a wavelength that are typically, at, there are, say, hundreds of times longer than the wavelengths that see their eyes. That means we're looking at things that are hundreds of times cooler. So instead of looking at stars that are thousands of degrees, we're looking at stuff between the stars at tens of degrees above absolute zero. So it's a temperature of minus 250 degrees C, that kind of temperature range. Very, very cold stuff. What in fact we're looking at is we're looking at gas and dust between the stars. That gas and dust absorbs the starlight and then re-emits it, because it's actually quite cool, at these longer wavelengths. The point about this graph is that ignoring that cosmic microwave background, that's the glow from the, the universe itself, that bump under where it says FIR, the far infrared, is about the same size as the bump on the left under stars. And what that tells us is there's the same amount of energy being emitted there. So if we ignore it, if we, all we did was visible astronomy, we'd be, we'd be missing out on half the energy in the universe. 